Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you do not leave us to guess at who you are or who we are, but you tell us. Father, our ears are so prone to be stopped up. Our hearts tend to be so hard. We ask that you would soften our hearts, that you would open our ears, that you would open our eyes to see the glory of who you are and who we are in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things, expectant that you will answer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you're not yet. Well, friends, we never stop being afraid of the dark. It's just that our sense of what's dark changes as we grow older. And right now, even though it's the middle of the day, it feels like there is a lot of dark. Right? We're afraid of the virus. We're afraid of government's response to the virus, or maybe both. We're afraid of the protests. We're afraid of what happens if we stop protesting, or maybe both. We're afraid of Trump winning, afraid of Biden winning, afraid of a contested election, afraid of a civil war. And that doesn't even count all the very personal things we are afraid of, our, our mental health failing, our physical health failing, our financial health failing, our kids' schooling failing. We have a lot of words for this feeling, anxiety, worry, stress, Whatever, we all feel it. We are all feeling this fear. Now, fear, of course, is not an improper emotion. It feels necessary to, to say that right now. Fear actually protects us in a world that has fallen. It's actually a gift of God. When I open the oven, it is good that I fear getting burned so I can put on an oven mitt. When I'm driving a car, I should fear a wreck so that I wear a seatbelt. Fear is a right and good emotion and a reality where things are not as they should be. And things are not as they should be. But where fear really begins to trap us is when we add to the darkness a sense that it's all out of our control. When we sense the darkness is come, uh, uh, closing in and there's nothing we can do about it. There are no oven mitts or seat belts available to us. Then fear can become something that doesn't protect us, but actually something that traps us, something that enslaves us. Fear of what's happening or what could happen begins to drive us to a place of despair. Our entire culture is sitting on the knife's edge of that kind of fear right now. We're terrified of what's coming next, and we feel powerless to do anything about it. But church, the most common command in the scriptures is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. When things are out of our control, when we can't see a path forward, there is always a reason for hope. There is always an answer to this darkness that is overwhelming us. We do not have to be trapped in fear as long as we keep in mind the last judgment. Now that's probably not what you would expect someone to say, right? You have no reason to fear because of the last judgment. Because the last judgment is something that sounds like it's designed to inspire fear. Right? But as we said in the kids' sermon, judgment is simply the act of God setting all things right. God turning right side up what is upside down. You see this all through the Psalms. When Israel is terrified, when it's at its wit's end, when it feels like everything is out of their control, they cry out, God, come and judge. Judgment is good news in those contexts. And at the last judgment, the idea is that everything is going, that is wrong is going to be made right once and for all, forever. All the things that seem impossible now will be made new. Hate will actually cease. Evil will literally be routed. Plagues will end, never to come back again. Whatever we fear is going to be wiped away. This talk of the last judgment in the scriptures is a reminder that we may not be in control, but he is. 
And even if the worst happens to us here, and it might, that worst can and will be reversed and set right in the life to come. Because if there is a last judgment, nothing here is final, not even death. It feels that way. But God can make even death right. Right? This is actually the, the best news that there can be, that no matter whether darkness seems to have the upper hand, no matter how permanently broken it all seems to be, the light is going to cast it out. There is no better news than that. Unless, of course, that darkness isn't just out there, but it's in here. This is why we often hear judgment as bad news, why the thought of it sometimes provokes fear, why we are often quick to stop thinking about it whenever it comes to mind, because the darkness is not just out there. If, as we grow in wisdom, we realize that we need to fear ourselves just as much as we fear what's out there. Years ago, a newspaper was, was seeking essay submissions on the question, what's wrong with the world today? If we were answering that, just from this week, there would be so many things you could choose from, right? It's been a heck of a week. There's so much that is wrong with the world. But G.K. Chesterton, a very pithy Catholic writer, wrote back to the newspaper two words, what's wrong with the world today? I am. I am what's wrong with the world today. I have often personally used the seven deadly sins as a bit of a diagnostic for my own life in terms of my own sin, asking God to meet me um, in these places. Pride, anger, greed, envy, sloth, lust, gluttony. And I used to kind of end each night um, writing in my journal, asking God, which, which of these did I succumb to today so I could confess and repent and receive forgiveness? And then I realized over time that it was much more appropriate to ask, how did I succumb to each one of these today? Because I am less safe than I think I am. I hurt others even those closest to me. I make mistakes willfully and accidentally. My failures are not just some aberration, a, a bug in an otherwise exemplary life. They are a recurring feature of my life. The darkness also lives within. So judgment if I stand on my own two feet, will not be a good thing because I regularly am living upside down and that means I'll be upended. I regularly give in to the darkness and that darkness is going to be destroyed. I should be afraid of myself. We all should be afraid of ourselves. If we're not, that's not a good sign. It's a sign you're either underestimating God's goodness or overestimating your own goodness. In today's passage, John is speaking to a people who know that fear of themselves. They're speaking to a people who are aware of, that own, of their own sinfulness, and as a result, they are tempted to shrink back from God because of it. Tempted to hide. But in this section, right, John has been talking about love. God's love for us, love that overflows into love for others. And in these verses that we read this morning, he is reaching the crescendo. He's reaching the climax. He's reaching the biggest picture he can paint of how critical love is. He's talking about how God's love reaches its completion in us, how it reaches its perfection, what it does when it's done, all that it's meant to do in us. 1 John 4, verse 17. He basically says, this is as good as it gets. This is how love is made complete among us. So that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. 
What John is trying to get across is that we don't have to be afraid, even of ourselves, even when we stand in the midst of perfect holiness. Because when God's love is made complete in us, when it reaches its goal, when it reaches its end, we can even have confidence there. He says in verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Again, John is, is not saying all fear is illegitimate, but he's saying that this kind of crippling fear, this fear of ourselves and fear of God that comes with it is unnecessary because our fear of ev everything out there is swallowed up in the confidence that God loves the world enough to judge it. And our fear of everything in here is swallowed up in the confidence that God loves us even through the midst of that judgment and he will carry us through it. Now, when we hear, when we hear these phrases about how, how, how love casts out fear, sometimes we start to expect that that will take away, his love will take away everything here that is worth fearing, right? That he'll make sure we're never harmed, that nothing bad will ever happen. We know this is where we internally end up because we're so surprised when bad things do happen. We're so surprised when suffering does come. And we're like, where is God? Where is his love? But there's a phrase in verse 17 that is really key to understanding what it means that we don't have to fear in his love. It says, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world... We are like Jesus. What is John talking about? In this world, we are like Jesus. It's a key phrase. Often, when we think about Jesus' journey, we think about the fact that he undertook something so we don't have to. It's like we were heading down this particular road, and Jesus took that road so that we could take a different road. And there is a, a truth to that in a manner of speaking. But what John is saying here, it's not that Jesus' journey replaces the journey we have to go through suffering and fear. It's that Jesus' journey is actually the template, actually the model, actually the example for our journey through fear. Because Jesus was not kept from the darkness. He did not get to avoid the things that we are so scared of. He plunged right into them. Jesus plunged right into violence and hostility and rejection and poverty and death. Everything we fear out there. And he also plunged right into temptation. Right into doubt in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right into a crushing sense of his father's absence on the cross. Everything we fear in here. He went all the places that we don't want to, want to go. But through all of it. He trusted that his father loved him. That his father wanted his good. That no matter how hard it got, no matter how scary it was, no matter how terrible the circumstances around him seemed to be, he was still his father's beloved son. He was still the apple of his eye, the joy of his heart. And that if he could not go around that darkness, he would be brought through it by the father who loved him. Even in the midst of experiencing things that, that would terrify us, he clung to the hope that he was not abandoned and that he would eventually be vindicated. That even when he released control and gave over his body to physical death and gave over his spirit to the spiritual death of separation from his father, he would still be vindicated because his father loved him. Friends, because of what Christ did, we don't get to avoid that kind of suffering. We don't get to avoid that path of fear. But we can walk it in a different way. Because we can know that all the weight of all the darkness of all the ages, even ours, was put on Him. And that just as He was vindicated, 
we will be vindicated. Just as he was resurrected, we will be resurrected. On that last judgment, despite all the mess and the pain and the failure, the world will be set right and we will be set right. As long as we trust in him. As long as we trust that in this world, we are like him in his journey through this world. Now this is tested again and again throughout our lives. There is always an invitation to experience his love deeper every time we come up against darkness. Many of us have stories of our first conversion, that first time we, we, we maybe came to a, at least a fresh awareness of that darkness and trusted Jesus in the midst of it. But that conversion is, is just the beginning. And I actually often think of death as our last conversion. Because in that moment, whenever we're last conscious of it, everything we fear and we run so hard to get away from will be upon us. And it will be completely out of our control. Death is kind of like that ultimate trust fall where we have to give up control. And for those of us who, who know that on the other side of death, we're going to be standing uh, naked before a perfectly good and holy God who has loved more passionately than we have ever loved anything, whose love shames our lack of it, there's another layer of trust fall. Am I going to be okay? Am I going to be safe? But in that moment, in that vulnerability, I invite you to picture it now. For those whose hearts have been trained to trust, we will experience for the first time perfect freedom. Because we will finally realize once and for all that we have nothing to fear. Because through his eyes, we will be able to see our failures and not cower. See our wounds and not hold back. See our own darkness in its fullness that we were even afraid to see. And see it completely bathed and transformed in light. Because we will be held in perfect love. Friends, it is knowing that love that will lead to a life that is truly free. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that that is our destiny, we can also claim that love in the present. And when we are able to receive it, that love uh, makes all that the world can do, as crazy as it is, all that we can do, as crazy as we are, a bit paler, a little, a little weaker. All the tricks that the world uses to manipulate our fears, all the promises, all the threats. We, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. We know what if. Love will remake the world. And it will remake us full stop. None of those what ifs will ultimately matter. This is what will be. Friends, when your world feels like it's ending, and even when the whole world ends, love is in control. That love may seem slow, it may feel weak, but it will not fail. Church, do not be afraid. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we are weak, that we are fragile, that there is darkness that feels more powerful than us. And we confess we don't always know what to do in the midst of that. Father, give us such an awareness of your love that we are not trapped in our fears. Give us such an awareness of your love 
that we are free. Free to love others. Free to love you. Free from our own anxiety and our own worry. Free to be at peace in our deepest places. Amen.